A very good evening to everyone uh, and thank you so much for joining us. A very warm welcome to all of you. Um, please do settle down. We'll give it a few minutes for everyone to come in. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, today's um, thematic webinar is going to be on engineering and technology, which I know is something that a lot of you are interested in, a lot of you want to know more about, a lot of you wish to study abroad, and that's exactly where this webinar comes in useful for you to know more about how you can study this, study this in the UK. And uh, we've left that uh, to the experts to uh, tell you more about it. We have a fantastic panel here with us today, um, but I just want to wait a couple of seconds for everybody to come in and settle down. I hope you're able to see everything. Joining us. Um, so I do want to kick this off um, and we have a really, really great panel with us today, so I'm excited to introduce them to you. Um, so we have with us uh, three UK universities joining us to talk about engineering and technology. Um, we have Peter Guff, and Prachi Hajela from Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, Peter is a senior lecturer there and Prachi works with the India team here. Uh, welcome Peter, welcome Prachi, it's great to have you both with us. Um, we also have with us University of Sheffield, we have Dr. Richard Thackeray and Kritika Garg. Um, Dr. Thackeray is lecturer in steel making and Kritika works with the country office. Uh, welcome Richard and Kritika, thank you so much for joining us from Sheffield. We also have with us University of Derby. We have um, Shaheda Mutaman and we have Michaela Green, who is the international officer and Shah and, uh, Shah and Shahid is, the, is a lecturer in motorsport engineering. Um, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. I think we're still waiting for Shahid to join, but I'm sure he'll be with us very shortly. Um, so it's great to have everybody. Uh, a little bit about the session today. Um, most of you are students of engineering and technology or wish to study it in the future. Um, the session today is not just going to kind of delve a little bit deeper into the subject and, you know, the kind of expertise that you would need to maybe pursue it for higher studies. But also it will give you an idea about what it you know what studying in the UK really entails. What kind of a background do you need? What sort of timelines do you need to bear in mind? Um, what even living there is like? You can also ask us about the graduate route and finding uh, you know the right career opportunities later. So really anything you want to know about studying in the UK in general, but also about specific courses and themes that we talk about here. Um, I know that our panel will be very, very happy to answer anything for you. Um, there is no such thing as a stupid question, so please ask us anything uh, you would want to know. Uh, there is a small Q&A box on your screen. Uh, you'll see the box with a question mark. That's where you put in your questions, and I will make sure that we are able to answer as many of those as possible, and some of the panelists will be answering them in the question box as well. So keep an eye on the question that you've asked and we'll make sure that it's it's been asked. Uh, it's been answered, sorry. Um, so on that note, I think we'll kick off. Uh, Peter, if you don't mind sharing your screen and um, enjoy everyone. Yeah, we can see your screen, Peter. That's good. Just making sure you. We can see the screen, Peter. My microphone decided not to work. The microphone is on. We can hear you, yeah. OK, that should be all right now, yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah. So but share the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's share uh, the screen again. There we go. That should be all right now. Yes, perfect. Oh, good. OK, sorry, right, some technical okay. issues there after rehearsing so many times. Hi, my name's uh, Peter Goff. As I, I'm, I, I work at Manchester Met University, which is, um, uh, you, you, I'll mention a little bit about Manchester as, as we go through. Um, but I look after all the um, the postgraduate programs in the Department of Engineering. Uh, 
I've been at MMU myself for over 20 years. I was a former student here. Uh, I came in sort of 1985 and then never went home. So um, I also lead on one of the courses that I'm going to show you today. OK, so let's just mention a little bit about Manchester. It, it really is um, a student city and as a, a huge scientific, industrial and cultural heritage um, across the two and a half square miles of Manchester with each of the institutions. You're looking at nearly 100,000 higher education students, which is a massive student population. You'll see this uh, Manchester B. Uh, don't worry, it's not, it's not to scale. Uh, you'll see this B all over the place and it, it represents Manchester being a hive of industry. Um, you see this on, on the trash cans, you see it on the lampposts, so it's a real symbol of Manchester. And, you know, we have some firsts, the, the first computer with a stored memory, we had the first passenger railway between Manchester and Liverpool to get the cotton from the coast to the mills. Uh, Ernest Rutherford split the atom in Manchester for the first time. And more recently, uh, graphene was discovered uh, somewhat by accident with a pencil and a piece of sellotape. But say so we've got a rich sort of uh, industrial and cultural heritage. Great place to be a student. So let's look at some numbers today. It's voted as the UK's best city to live in. So I live in Manchester, just sort of five miles to the east of the city centre. And for being a student, third best student city in the UK, I say I came here in, in the late 80s and, and never, I never left. Just a few numbers, um, how many students we have just in, in MMU, it's a huge student population um, with massive investment in, um, especially now in, directly in what we're talking about here, which is our science and engineering provision. If we just follow the green arrow down, uh, this is a live picture taken this morning from um, our brand new um, science and engineering building. It's well, it's actually ahead of schedule. Uh, it's scheduled to open in 2023 and the, all the uh, science and engineering programs will be based, uh, all the, the, the practical side of it will be based in there. And this is a view from Chester Street um, where you will approach and enter the building and it's got these sort of super labs inside. As a university, I wouldn't say we're unique, but it, it's, uh, it's really, if you look at this photograph and you can see where our buildings are, we are, truly are a city centre university we have an m1 postcode which is manchester one we're right in the center of the of the of the um of the city connecting to all the attractions and distractions that the, that the city offers um it's like a great place to be a student you're not sort of out on a limit in a, a nearby district you're right in the center of the city um manchester itself you you may know already for for more sporting reasons uh, I support neither of these teams myself, but uh, it's good to mention just two miles away in either direction. Uh, you can go and see Manchester City and Manchester United, which you know are known worldwide and have won many sort of Premier League titles between them. Um, you'll also be aware that um, Old Trafford, which is um, a cricket pitch just uh, again about just under two miles from where you would be studying and where uh, Sachin Tendulkar scored his first Test 100, aged just 17 uh, in 1990. Um, so again, that's just under two miles from, from where you'd be studying. Um, getting a bit closer to the university itself, um, facilities, we have something that is um, that we've built up over a number of years called Print City. And um, this is uh, it's on an island site near the university. It's open to all students, but really for anything, not just coursework. So if you had personal 3D printing projects that you wanted to do, if you just wanted to make something for yourself, it's open access to uh, students to use uh, Print City. We have nearly 70 3D printers in there. We have laser scanners. Uh, we're involved in three big European projects looking to turn plastic waste into 3D print filaments. Um, and to use recycled concrete to make 3D printed street furniture and sculptures. Uh, so all that will be around you as and when you're here. Um, but if we look a bit closer towards the programmes within the department, um, Industry 4 is at, the, is at the heart really of what we're, what we're doing here. Um, Industry 4 is gaining momentum faster than the previous three. Um, it's, it's touching every industry and sector right across the globe. Um, I would say all our courses are postgrad. Our three courses are, are you know, all industry for focused. I'll start with the first one, which is a new, a new for this year. Uh, it's been developed over the past two years. Uh, engineering smart systems in conjunction with these two giants, uh, Siemens and Autodesk. We work very closely with those. This course was not just 
um, so let's let's do this. It was it was designed by advice of what we call our industrial advisory board, uh, which has members of lots of different sectors. We have people from Rolls Royce, from, from Jaguar Land Rover, um, CNC Robotics over in Liverpool, and these all feed into what they want students to have before they you know when they leave university. So to make the people really employable, and so we work with Siemens with their what's called the connected curriculum which brings their, their hardware and the software together and into a sort of off the shelf bundle that includes um, their software curriculum examples um, and real life problem solving tutorials. Um, the staff in the university are part of the uh, smart infrastructure research group um, and then again that looks at industry four and uh, you know, five, 5G. So um, again access to specialist facilities I already mentioned Print City. Um, I'll mention a little bit more on that on the next programme. Um, and you know the, the Siemens PLM suites as well. Engineering project management, um, whatever we like to build or make, it all needs to be project manager. So think about this as being a role of a conductor of an orchestra really. You don't need to know how to do every single job, you need to know how to make all these different things work together and arrive together at a desired result. And again, this one has a blend of technical engineering skills. It's not all theory. Um, you are, you know, there's practical elements to all of our, our units, quite strong practical elements, um, sort of do to learn rather than learn to do. Um, again, access to the, the 3D print facility uh, and of course the brand new uh, building once that's up and in, um, in 2023. The next one, I'm hopefully on time. Uh, the next one is the MSc Industrial Digitalization. This one has been running about this is its fifth year. Um, we have some really good friends of this course, notably Professor Jürgen Meyer, who is the former CEO of Siemens UK. And this is a direct quote. He says, I do hold Manchester Met University's MSc as best in class, as do key players like Festo, Siemens and other leading industry four companies. Uh, he even says at the bottom, where can I sign up? And we, we spent a lot of time with him over the summer. Uh, speaking with our students. Uh, three of our former students on this program are recognised in a, a publication called The Manufacturer and in the top 50 young people making manufacturing smarter we have three former students in there. Um, we do tend to concentrate on the final of the three letters, you can, three words you can see, tool set, skill set, mindset, but we concentrate on mindset, um, making you not be afraid to try new things and developing ideas outside of your comfort zone to allow you to be truly creative. Um, Print City, as I have mentioned before, um, that's where the majority of your time will be spent if you if you joined on this course. Um, wherever possible, we, we have companies who come to see us, um, about five companies a year, who, who, sorry, a week, who come through there looking for things to, to be prototyped or made, and wherever possible, we put that in the hands of our, of our students. Okay, so uh, short and sweet. I uh, didn't want to, uh, hopefully I was to time. So um, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Peter. That was excellent. It was definitely short and sweet. You spoke about such intense curves. So I think everyone, you you definitely had everyone's um, attention. Uh, so thank you for that. I think we'll... Hi, yeah, this uh, works. Thank you, Peter, for the presentation. Few points we wanted to add about the scholarships that we may want to inform students about, please. Peter, do you yeah. mind? Uh, do you want to maybe stop sharing so we can see Prachi on the screen? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Prachi, off you go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Prachi. I manage the India team operations. Me and my team are mainly here on ground to make sure that all our Indian students get all the ample amount of support that you may expect or rather look forward to when you are really searching for the best university for your future prospects. So to begin with, we can help you understand the different kind of scholarships that you may be eligible for. Uh, for example, we offer international postgraduate scholarship, which is up to three thousand dollars. Then we have the vice chancellor scholarship, which is an academic scholarship, which is up to eight thousand dollars. And there are plenty of other scholarships like sports and others which are purely dependent on your evaluation of your overall profile because they are case to case basis. In addition to that, we can even help you understand if let's say you qualify for certain waivers, for instance, IELTS or TOEFLs, depending on the qualification that you've attained in the past. That is your class 12th port or the university you've graduated from. Uh, there are a lot of other questions 
queries that you may have. So if you're looking forward to even speak with a current student or an alumni of our university, we are more than happy to help you connect with a brilliant faculties like Peter or one of our alumni to help you understand and get your real time information of what's actually happening right now at the campus. So this is all from my side. Thank you so much. I three over to you. Thanks so much, Prachi. That was really useful. Um, I have there are a couple of questions that are coming in. Uh, Peter, if I may ask you, um, there is a which I know. I mean, Prachi has answered it. Uh, so has Kritika, but I still want to maybe ask you if you want to come on video. Um, is it tough to get a job in the UK after completing engineering? And uh, do UK companies, you spoke about some companies in your presentation. Uh, do UK companies prefer to hire UK or EU students over international students? Where does an international student really stand, a student from India, when it comes to the job market? Well, that's quite an easy one to answer, really. The UK companies, like any company around the world, there's a, there's a distinct lack of digital skills. There's a digital skills shortage. Um, in the first year of my own program in running, we had 100% employment. Um, we had two overseas students. Uh, they went from India, but we had two overseas students and say so we had 100% employability in the UK on the end of the, of the first year. But, um, you know, regardless of the, you know, our MMU program, you know, the same with Sheffield and Derby, you'll hear you know, today, engineering students are highly sought after, especially with the digital skills which these companies really crave. Um, I can't guarantee people work, but it's like it's like anything else. The better people tend to um, you know, rise to the top and get those better positions. But for example, my course has just finished. Um, the industrial digitalization course has just completed. And of the 13 students on there, seven are already got a job before they even finished. So and some of them are doing research, some of them have done research, some of them have moved on to other, co other companies. But um, the prospects of, are, are pretty good. And I don't think it's selective whether it's it's a UK based um, member of staff because there's a shortage. They, they welcome anybody with, um, with the right skill set mindset. Exactly. I think that's what um, Prachi, Kritika and the others have said as well. So thank you for that. Um, Richard, thank you for answering the question on PhD. Uh, a PhD typically takes three and a half years in engineering as well. Uh, Peter, a question for you is is any data science program available in your university? Prachi, Peter, either of you can answer that. Yes. So I'll let Prachi say that one, yeah. Thanks, Peter. I figured you may uh, give it to me. <laughs> uh, yes, we do have uh, that program. For details, you can actually visit the website I've entered in the chat box. And for any future uh, detailed uh, your profile evaluation, of course, we are there to have a look and let you know whether or not you are eligible for that. Brilliant. And any postdoc positions available at MMU? Postdoctoral positions or opportunities? Again, these positions are entirely dependent on your individual profile. Please yeah. write to us so that we can have a look and let you know. Also, the prerequisites, whether or not you fit. Exactly. Brilliant. I think with postdoc, it is a, it is case by case. It's not a generic uh, call, is it? So. Excellent. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Prachi. That was really useful. We're expecting many more questions to come in, so I'm going to move on swiftly um, to University of Sheffield. Um, if I may request Dr. Thackeray to please come on screen um, and start sharing your screen. Okay, good evening, yep. everyone. Can you we see can the screen and hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Thackeray. Uh, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about engineering at the University of Sheffield. Um, so let's start off by saying what we do uh, in engineering at Sheffield. Well, we advance understanding. We, we cover all of the engineering disciplines and we ensure that we have experts teaching our students in a, in a research led environment. We like to make a difference as well. We are pioneering research uh, and working in, in specialist areas of, of engineering that are distinctive to Sheffield. We try and influence and shape policy too, uh, and we do that locally, nationally, globally, uh, and we try and find some solutions to, to the world's problems. And we also power industry. We work in partnership with, uh, with Boeing and Siemens, 
uh, all the way through to, uh, to local enterprises and local companies. We have seven academic departments uh, and three interdisciplinary programs, general engineering, bioengineering and aerospace. They offer a range of undergraduate and postgraduate uh, programs, staff from 65 countries, and that leads to uh, over six and a half thousand students in the faculty from over 100 different countries. 2,600 of those are international students. And as I said, one of the, one of the, uh, the, the selling points of Sheffield, if you, if you like, is the research led teaching delivered by academics uh, who are experts in their field. So as well as the undergraduate taught courses in materials, and civil and computer science, and mechanical engineering, bioengineering, for example, we also offer a large suite of postgraduate taught courses. So you can do a postgraduate taught course in mechanical engineering, but you can also do advanced mechanical engineering or mechanical engineering with management. And the same applies to electrical engineering. You can do a postgraduate taught course in electrical engineering, or you can further specialise, in this case, into wireless communication systems, semiconductor photonics and electronics, and so on and so on. And a full list of these programmes and their specialities are available on the website. One of the uh, other aspects of Sheffield, of course, is the, is the campus, the environment. Here is a picture of a diamond on the left hand side. Hopefully you can see why it's called the diamond. Um, and if you are a student at Sheffield, you'll spend a lot of time in the diamond, both in lectures and in labs. The, the diamond houses uh, 19 different lab spaces from tissue engineering through to thermodynamics, aerospace simulation and propulsion. We have some mini jet engines in there and also a pharmaceutical pilot plant which features uh, state-of-the-art integrated manufacturing processes. So it's labs with industry standard equipment, and this all leads to a high quality learning experience. And then we've got the heart space as well. This is an award-winning addition to the campus at Sheffield, uh, right in the heart of the engineering campus. And this supplies student society laboratory space, as well as plenty of social areas for collaboration, meetings, project work, etc. We also deliver world leading research in many, many areas, uh, energy storage and manufacture, for example, electrical machines and drives, semiconductors, dynamics and acoustics. That's just a, a small sample of some of our research themes. We're the faculty's second for research income in the UK, over £110 million uh, in recent years. So uh, we really are leading the UK in terms of uh, engineering research. What about student support? Well, it's in sort of three levels. Um, support from the university, health service and counselling service, support from your department, so a pastoral tutor who will stay with you for your time at Sheffield and they'll be able to give you advice on academic and personal issues and even provide your first job reference. All the way through to departmental staff and student committees where you can get involved, change the department, change your programme uh, and really contribute uh, during your stay in Sheffield. And that's balanced on the other side by student life outside of the classroom. So lab access outside of course teaching for project work, student ambassador schemes where you can represent your programme or represent your department at various outreach events. And also student led societies and competitions, a great way to learn outside of the classroom uh, and as Peter said, you know, learn by doing, put your skills into action. And here's a really nice example. This is Project Sunride. This is a competition where you design, you build and you fly rockets. And here is our winning team from 2019. The aim was to deliver a rocket for 10,000 feet. And our team did quite well. We got it to 10,017 feet um, at just over uh, the speed of sound. So lots and lots of examples of student led societies like this where you can learn and have fun at the same time. It's really easy for me uh, and I'm very pleased to, to say how great Sheffield is, but um, sometimes it's nice to hear from our students. So here's Andrea, recently completed a BSc. She liked being surrounded by motivated individuals. It brought her out of her comfort zone. It made her get involved in things that uh, she's passionate about, uh, and, uh, and focus on new challenges. She also liked being part of an international campus, surrounded by individuals, and liked being in a city that values its student community. 
We've talked a bit about scholarships at Sheffield. Uh, we offer scholarships for undergraduate and postgraduate uh, students. So our recent intake of undergraduate students were offered academic scholarships of up to £3,000. Um, we also offer scholarships for international postgraduate taught students. Uh, the value of those hasn't yet been confirmed, but please visit the websites for further details and to find out if you're eligible and how much you are eligible for those scholarships. Employability is another uh, thing that we take very seriously at Sheffield. Uh, our graduate starting salary uh, six months after graduation is about £26,000. And of course, that increases uh, if you go on to, to further chartered engineer or scientist status. Here is a very small snapshot of some of the, the recent graduate destinations. You can see from a very wide ranging faculty, there's a very wide range of graduate destinations all the way up from global companies down to smaller local and regional enterprises, spin out companies, etc. We support you in terms of employability in a number of ways. I'm just going to pick out one or two of these. Um, our university teachers have got extensive industry experience and so they can relate their experiences to you. We have a number of year in industry courses and industrial training programs and employability skills are embedded into your degree. So Global Engineering Challenge, for example, um, all of these um, ways in which we support you increase your employability uh, as you come to graduate. And if you are doing a year undergraduate year in industry, then we have a dedicated employability team who will help you find a placement. Your department will give you support and monitoring during your placement. And students who've done the year in industry previously will also feed back on what they learned during their placement, um, which again helps you with the whole experience of a year in industry. What about Sheffield though? We think it's a hub for engineering industries. It's a great place to be an engineering student. It's got a rapidly growing digital industry sector and engineering and manufacturing sectors. And we work very closely with local companies to try and connect them to our students. And we do that through industry talks and events and showcases, uh, all the way through to faculty and departmental industry advisory boards. And again, this leads to opportunities during your, uh, your studies for internships, maybe part-time work, as well as, of course, increased employability after you graduated. We're linked to the major players, Siemens, Rolls-Royce, IBM. They sit on our industry advisory boards. Companies from across the UK come to Sheffield to meet our students. And we run these engineering project weeks, which allow you to, to link up and create connections with, with some of these companies, as well as the opportunity to meet and collaborate with industry experts. And our previous Vice Chancellor, Keith Burnett, said that areas such as Sheffield will play a crucial role in the new industrial revolution in the UK, one that's centred on science and innovation, but that works hand in hand with industry. And one of those big successes is the AMRC, the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre. It was established 20 years ago. I can't believe how time has flown. Between Boeing and the University of Sheffield, it carries out truly world leading research into advanced machining, manufacturing, material science. And so we have experts in machine automation, robotics, additive manufacturing, design for manufacturing, testing and training. And the success of the AMRC has meant that a number of those collaborators have established um, facilities close by in Sheffield. And one of those is Boeing. This is the new Boeing Sheffield. It's the first Boeing manufacturing facility in Europe. Uh, and it's initiated a major R&D program with the AMRC and the university to develop new manufacturing techniques that will be applied in this new Boeing Sheffield facility. And another of these success stories is McLaren. McLaren Automotive, the supercar chassis will be built in Sheffield, a uh, boost to, the, to the, the local and, and UK economy with new jobs created. But also it's part of this ongoing partnership between McLaren and the AMRC and the university, uh, which has also led to the development of McLaren's new Composites Technology Centre. So uh, just three very short case studies uh, of the way in which we interface and interact with our industrial collaborators. And finally, the city itself, it's a very green city. It's one of the greenest cities in Europe. There's lots of parks and open spaces, lots of student accommodation. 
it's quite a small uh, city, Sheffield, large population, but quite a small city, excellent nightlife and activities. Um, and like Manchester and like Derby, we are very close to the Peak District, uh, which is one of the UK's national parks uh, and all the outdoor activities that are on offer um, in that national park. And again, it's nice to hear from some of our former students. Uh, he's Rishi, who, who recently finished uh, an MEng in electrical engineering. He liked the fact that Sheffield was quite large, but it was personal. It breathes life with its diversity in nightlife, and it doesn't lose touch with its beautiful natural surroundings. And it's widely spread out, so it's not too intimidating either. Um, and that's really nice to hear from some of our former students. And it's a really nice way also for me to finish. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, as it says on the slide, um, we're here to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. That was really useful, uh, very thorough, I, but and as expected, tons of questions are pouring in. Um, thank you to those who are answering them in the box, uh, Prachi, Trithika, thank you so much for doing that. Um, but I'll still bring some questions to you. I'm going to request um, the others to also come on video so I can take the questions to everyone. Um, OK, here's I'm just going from the bottom now because uh, the ones at the top are being answered. Uh, does the does um, I think this is for Sheffield, does the department organize seminars and conferences that students can attend if they want to kind of, you know, get a taste of your, uh, you know, the classroom experience or something? Yes, so um, I guess that will fall into sort of open days. We run open days for, for applicants and pre-applicants. We also run open days specifically targeted at international undergraduate and postgraduate students. And I think we also run uh, specific uh, in-country based seminars as well. Um, uh, Critica, you might be able to, to, to shed a bit more light on that, but uh, we have run events specifically aimed at the Indian market. That's great. Critica, do you want to come in on anything? Yeah, uh, so we do, do, uh, do, uh, we do taste lectures. In, for Indian students, specifically with the team, with the engineering team, so that's there. We Thank can you. get in touch with the student. I'll just share the link, but the student can fill in the forms. So that next time we do one. Great. Thank you. Um, what master's degree courses are available in civil engineering? Is there any unique civil engineering course that is available in the UK, but not much in other places? Um, Richard, do you want to answer this? And then uh, Shahid. Peter, feel, feel free to chime in. Um, I'm not aware of the specific um, postgraduate programs uh, in civil, but I know that in terms of undergraduate, we run civil engineering with architecture, for example, which is a very popular course. It's a dual course. Um, I would certainly suggest looking at the, uh, the postgraduate website. Maybe Critica can put the link up in the in the chat. Yeah. Um, and as always, um, when you look at the website, there will be a contact, someone who you can contact at Sheffield, who will be able to uh, either answer the question themselves or signpost you to a person who can answer your specific question. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, there was a question around whether some whether the student needs to give their IELTS. Uh, Prachi and Kritika, you've answered that. It depends case to case, but more often than not, you do need to sit in, so it's always um, good to check with the university. Um, this is a good one. Um, I'd like to request uh, Darby to also come on screen if possible, as well as MMU. Um, is energy engineering with industrial management a good option and you know, does it have good career opportunities? Uh, is that something any of the universities here offer? Energy engineering? I, I, yeah, yeah. I, we, we would offer something similar and um, Yes, I think, um, you know, one of the global buzzwords at the moment, of course, is energy, fuel. So having expertise exactly. in, in energy, um, renewables and alternative sources of energy uh, will, will only be a good thing. Um, I can't see how that could, could be a bad thing for you. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, Shahid, do chime in if there's anything to add. Um, OK. There are questions around, OK, what are the options for biomedical engineering? Kritika and Prachi have answered this very nicely in the chat. Uh, Michaela or Shahid, do you want to come in? Is, is, is that something you offer at Derby? 
I could maybe reply. So we don't have anything yeah. in the biomed, but I wanted to mention that we do have an embassy in geoenergy, uh, which would tie in with the other question. And that's right. uh, new for this year. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. I think this is a question for everybody. Prachi has answered it. Uh, will there be industrial placement? Um, Richard, Kritika, Michaela, Shahid, do you want to? So yes, in terms of the undergraduates, you can do undergraduate courses within industrial placement. That's typically in your penultimate year of your undergraduate degree. And you will typically spend 12 months on your industry placement. We've had people go very close to Sheffield and halfway around the world on their industrial placement. It very much depends on your, your personal preference, um, okay. but sky, the sky is the limit. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a very popular course, very popular programs. They're great for employability. They're great for you to, to meet with your prospective employer. Darby, do you want to come in? Shahid, would you like to take that question? You're on mute, Shai. Hello, hi. Uh, so yes, uh, in uh, Darby, especially in the mechanical engineering and motorsport engineering, which I'm involved, we have the uh, one year placement as the, uh, the foundation year, which uh, this thing can involve the industry and uh, pass this through one year uh, as the uh, foundation year and can increase the chance for uh, finding the job more easier with uh, after this placement. Thank you. This is I really like this question. Um, and Peter, if I can come to you with this, well, Prachi's answered it, but I think it'll be nice to hear it as well. Uh, what is the split between theory and practical when studying engineering? Uh, if we look at the um, the current timetable, which have just been on this morning, um, there's a, a blend of, uh, well, we are a campus based university, so we expect students to be on campus. Um, yeah. It's you know it's it's a sort of discipline where you need to get your hands involved and, and do things make things find things um but having said that it's not all um on campus and the reason that is is that we found with with covid that um some of the lectures we moved to online delivery especially the theory sessions and we actually found that that gave advantages we didn't have before it lets us um let's just bring in external speakers we don't have to travel and get them to travel to manchester and and you know, last year we had um we had a number of i think in in six weeks we had 10 different speakers from from industry we had people from uh, a guy who runs a, a virtual reality studio creates resources for vr training and you know all, everything around that so it is a blend of um on campus and uh, you know face to face as we call it and um, you know, online, online delivery as well. But say so we are the message from MMU is we're, we're a campus-based university, and we, yeah. you know, we, we like to see uh, students in and on site doing things. Prachi. Thank you, Peter. I'd just like to add what uh, Peter has actually said. There are a few uh, facilities as well that we try and offer students as support. So we offer lifetime career placement support through our alumni network, which is a very strong link, I can say, with our 250 uh, million alumni network that we have around the globe now with us. In addition to that, we also tend to provide you the guidance during those two years now. That means now with the graduate immigration route, students can stay back for two more years. So we have a new team established, which is called as Early Careers Team. This team's responsibility is to ensure they handhold you during these two years after you've graduated to ensure you get the best career placements during these times as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Prachi. Uh, Sheffield, this one is for you. Uh, I'm a final year undergrad student uh, in civil engineering. Is are there any specific courses in geotechnical engineering or soil mechanics at the University of Sheffield? If you do have that, then what are the eligibility criteria, etc.? Um, that's thanks for that, Swaraj. That's a really good question. Um, I, again, I'm not aware of any uh, particular um, master's courses in soil mechanics. Um, but uh, again, if you were to visit the website and look at the civil engineering department, you'll be able to answer that question. Uh, and uh, again, you'd also find the information there about eligibility criteria and fees and, and the scholarships that will be available to you. So thanks Brilliant. for that. Question. 
Thank you. Thanks for that. I'm just going to ask uh, Darby to come in on the next one. I think this one's for you, Shahid. Um, what are the scope? What is the scope in the UK for an electronics engineer and also for robotics in masters? Shahid, do you want to answer this one? Sorry, can you answer it again? Sorry, uh, what are the prospects for studying robotics and electronics engineering in the UK? Uh, we have University of Derby uh, has the uh, electronic and uh, electronic engineering, but I'm not because I'm from uh, mechanical and motorsport engineering. I'm not exactly know about it more detail about the robotic field or not, but we have the electronic. Uh, department, but I'm not really sure about the specific robotic uh, sector. Okay, that's but fine. Yeah, can, yeah, can uh, maybe add? Yes, please, yeah. Miguel. So uh, the robotics aspect and AI definitely comes into place for our MSc in mechanical and uh, manufacturing engineering. Um, and then we do have electronics at both UD and MPG level as well. Um, so that Within the mechanical and manufacturing, there's also um, aerospace elements um, because of our close work with Rolls Royce and Toyota. Thank you. Uh, last question before I move on to Darby's presentation. Um, Peter, do you want to come in on this one? What skills do you expect from an electrical engineer applying for a post graduation in biotech or biomedical engineering? It's a bit of a subject specific one. Um. So this is for me, yeah. This so the, I mean, the three calls. If you're if you're happy to take it, uh, if anyone else wants to come in, that's fine as well. But basically, it's around the skills that one needs from an electronic, from an electrical engineer applying for a post graduation in biotech or yeah, biotech. Well, that's, yeah, that's part of our, our standard offer is um, a background in engineering. Uh, so whether that be electrical, or mechanical, um, yeah. So that's all. That would be a strength of an application. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, OK, well, last question, I promise, uh, before we move on. Uh, Richard, do you want to come on? Come, come in on this one? What is the percentage of graduating students after completing masters? Do they find jobs in their respective career fields, especially in mechanical? I know it's tough to give a percentage, but is this something that finds a lot of employability uh, in the UK? Yeah, so I, I do know the answer for the undergraduate students um, and in, in uh, the average across the Faculty of Engineering is 92%. Uh, for mechanical engineering, I think it's a little higher, I think it's 95%. So in other words, 95% of students graduating from mechanical engineering will be in a graduate level employment, so it may include research, within six months after graduation. So those numbers are very good at the moment, we'd like to push them even higher. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're very good at the moment. I think, as, as Peter mentioned, there is a, you know, there, there are a lot of companies in the UK who are really crying out for good engineers. Um, yeah. And I think that reflects in, our, in, in some of our employability statistics. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, there are more questions coming in. I request uh, Prachi, Kritika, Michaela to continue answering those. Uh, it's really useful to have it up there so people can read it and go back to it. Uh, on that note, uh, Shahid, if I may request you to please share your screen and uh, present on Darby. Okay, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, do you want to go to presenter mode? Yeah. Okay, can I start? Yes, please. Just set the time. Okay, hello, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Shahid Motaman. I'm from, I'm lecturer uh, in, the, uh, in the School of the Engineering in the uh, field of the motor sport engineering. And uh, today I'm going to, uh, uh, to, pre to uh, present you the University of Derby, especially in the field of the motor sport engineering. Okay, uh, at the University of Derby, uh, we have the field of the motorsport engineering program. 
which uh, has th three different uh, sectors and categories in uh, mechanical, in the uh, sorry, in the uh, MEng motorsport engineering. We have the BEng honor of motorsport engineering, and we have the foundation um, uh, uh, BEng with the foundation with, with, with one year foundation year at the motorsport uh, engineering. So first, uh, I'm going to say why uh, or where is the Derby or why you're going to study in the University of Derby. So um, first, the city of the Derby is in, is in the uh, heart of the UK and we are in the middle of the country. So we have a good access to uh, different uh, north big cities like Manchester or, or Leeds with just one and a half hour driving. And also we are uh, close to London with trains about uh, uh, one and a half hour and with the driving is about two and a half uh, hour driving so we have a good access to uh, such kind of these big cities and also the derby is the uh, host of the uh, very well known manufacturing company like the Royce Royce, Bombardier and Toyota and so uh, this uh, option for this city uh, makes it a very good opportunity for the students who graduated from uh, the University of Derby to become more involved in these companies because sometimes they can spend more of their uh, placement in such a kind of these uh, well-known uh, companies. So it has a good advantage of this city, which is the host of these uh, big companies. And also uh, the Derby has a large uh, workforce employed in the professional sectors and great location, great tra transport links, which I explained, and the city has a rich in uh, heritage. Uh, okay, uh, University of Derby is among uh, one of the top university among 14 universities which introduced the motorsport engineering. And uh, especially I'm talking about the, we have different sector of the mechanical and manufacturing uh, engineering, but I'm specifically talking about uh, motorsport engineering uh, uh, at, at, at Derby. So uh, based on that, if you choose uh, this field, you have a great options for use of the facility, very great facility which University of Derby has, especially in the motor sports sectors. So basically, uh, based on the uh, options, you're going to choose for uh, the field of the BN, for example, in motor sport engineering. Uh, you have some um, facilities here like the accredited by the partial uh, chartered engineering level so after the after the graduation if you are become if you're going to become a charter engineering because this field uh, has been accredited by the uh, uh, institute of mechanical engineering imaki so you have this option to be apply uh, to be able to apply for this uh, chartered engineering level also uh, it's a nationally uh, recognized qualification. You have the live project, you have the uh, highly skilled uh, uh, PhD and um, technician staffs, okay, and uh, also uh, you have uh, be able to access to the standard uh, facility and also we have very good workshop and the state of the state of art workshop uh, for the motorsport engineering. And also during the study of the, for example, BNG of motorsport, it can involve, except of your final project, you can be involved to the other extra curricular like the uh, 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 like the Formula Student Race uh, project, which is a very uh, big uh, race uh, uh, championship among the uh, universities in the UK and each university is participate as a team in this uh, Formula Students Championship, which uh, in this uh, championship you are going, you can become involved to design, uh, make and test the Formula Student car in different sectors like the uh, CFT computational modeling or aerodynamics. You can involve on the composite or making the materials for chassis or in the suspension. So as the part, as the, as the extra uh, part of your uh, BNG field, you can involve to such a kind of this project. Uh, also, during the study of the BNG in the uh, motorsport engineering, you can involve to, these are some samples of what you are going to uh, study during this course. For example, 
uh, you are going to study applied science methods, computer aided design, which use a computer or SOLIDWORKS software to uh, design different parts of the car. And, and this can be general, it can be a race car or a passenger car. So you will learn how to use of these softwares to design very complicated parts of the car. Uh, you have such a kind of these subjects like the materials and manufacturing process, motorsport and motorcycle te uh, technical applications, powertrain technologies, which can involve on the new powertrain systems like the uh, hybrid powertrain for um, electronic cars. You will learn much about these things in more details. And also we will learn something about the motorsport, just engineering, about the design, about the vibration and, every, and everything which involved on the design of the uh, uh, race car or a passenger car. You will involve on that during this uh, BNG course. Uh, also, this slide shows you uh, the syllabus and the courses you are going to learn uh, or you are going to study during the three years uh, course of the uh, BNG study. So it shows you some uh, feeling about what courses you are going to uh, study, like the powertrain, motorsport electronics, advanced apply, unless it's during the level four, level five, or level six, which is the first year, second year, and the third year. And also you have the optional uh, placement here. And just shows you some brief uh, description about what courses you are going to uh, study during the BNG of the motorsport in the rest of Derby. Uh, also, uh, we have another field of the foundation uh, FD engineering as the, in the motorsport engineering, which is the similar to the B Eng, but you have one year placement in the industry, which is a four years course. OK, because you spend one year in the industry, so this would be beneficial for students who actually after the gradu uh, graduation, there are more opportunity to uh, find a job, especially maybe in, the, in that placement you spend the industry, they are willing to have you and take you because you are become more familiar with them and you work with them and they know you better. So this foundation year of, in the motor sport engineering, it has, a, that it has this advantage to the other uh, uh, field, which is more uh, possibility of getting more job at the, at, at the, uh, after graduation. Uh, also, uh, based on the placement here, so there are some benefits. Uh, be a step ahead in the grad uh, in the uh, after graduation for finding a job, especially in the job market, you have better opportunity. Create a network of industry contact and subsequent job opportunity. Gain an additional qualification, the diploma in the professional practice, and develop a range of the work related to these skills. Because, as I said. Uh, University, University of Derby has a very good connection with uh, Royce Royce, with uh, Bombardia and uh, Toyota. So uh, most of our students, they um, have better opportunity to become involved in these industries because most of the uh, technicians or lecturer, they have very good connection to these companies. And we have very lot of research pro uh, program with Royce Royce, for example, or Bombardia or Toyota. So based on that, you are all the time involving and uh, contacting with some uh, lecturers which have which are already involved in more practical industrial projects. So it would increase more opportunity for the students after graduation to have a good network to the industries to become to find a job. So this is another benefit of the uh, University of Derby. Uh, also, in the terms of the undergraduate degree, we have the MNG Motorsport Engineering. So in this image, again, you have the four year uh, course or for, it's, it's a four year degree and uh, it has a little bit different from the BNG, which you will learn a little bit more uh, detail about the uh, designing of the motorsport cars. And also you will have you will get a better opportunity if you are going to apply for the charter engineering. So uh, again, this um, uh, field has been re re recognized by the uh, IMAC Institute of Mechanical Engineering in the UK. So again, uh, you have better uh, opportunity to apply for the charter engineering. And also based on this MNG Motorsport, you are going to learn more detail and you involve more specifically in deep, deeply more in the uh, design of the uh, motorsport uh, sector. So these are again the list of the uh, some uh, uh, study materials you're going to learn more than the BNG 
students, you have the advanced internal combustion engine and something more about thermodynamics and the thermal science of, of the engine. You have you can be involved in more research part and you learn something more about the research, how to do the research. Uh, you will learn more about the advanced computational fluid dynamics, which is very interesting field. So beside of the uh, BNG student, you will learn more uh, about the computational fluid dynamics, which again, this is an, another advantage for you to find a job in the future. And also these are uh, just, it shows you how uh, there's some uh, step up of the, uh, between the image and the BNG. Uh, it's still, it's, it's still, the, it's still the image is is uh, involved in uh, in the undergraduate degree, but it has uh, you involved in more details of the uh, of these studies of these materials which show here. But you have better opportunity for finding a job because you're involved in more deeper side of the science in the motorsport uh, industries and design. We step up uh, also University of Derby. Uh, offers the postgraduate uh, study for the MS in motorsport engineering. And also we have the PhD uh, research field, but this MS in motorsport engineering. So it's uh, again uh, accredited by the IMAC key and you can be applied very easily for become a chartered engineer. Uh, OK, uh, as I said, uh, after or during your study in the in the BNG of the uh, motor sport, you can involve in the Formula Student uh, Championship, which is the one of, which is very interesting championship, which is very big championship. And all of these uh, universities theme uh, participate uh, in this uh, champion and, and, in, and in this race and they're designing their own cars so you can become involved to design uh, your uh, uh, formula student car in, and you can learn a lot about how, how to uh, work as a team or you can learn a lot of things for designing the uh, small F1 uh, race car. And also these are some pictures about our previous uh, cars which is something like that in this championship. So also these are some uh, graduated which uh, you can see from they are uh, graduated from University of Derby and they're involved in different sectors of the Lotus or uh, different companies after graduation. Also, the, again, some samples of our graduated students which are involved in different sectors of the uh, very interesting field of the motorsport and motor racing sectors. You can see here from uh, Honda or McLaren after that we can involve in such kind of these uh, companies and also there are the list of the uh, companies which are uh, our students after graduation, they, they directly can go in these sectors of the uh, Mercedes or McLaren or any uh, kind of these companies which are involved in the F1 um, race uh, sectors. So it's a very big uh, sectors and you can directly go after graduation to one of these uh, sectors because um, as I said, then you involve in more practical sessions like the F1 team in your CV, so you have better opportunity to become uh, to find a job in such a kind of these big sectors here, in these industries of the race cars. Uh, OK, uh, again here it's talked about uh, motorsport engineering graduates, which they do. Uh, these are the sectors you can go in, like the data engineering, race engineering, vehicle dynamics engineering. So these are the sectors you can uh, involved on that after the graduation and, the, and these are the sample jobs title you can be involved after graduation. Uh, there are some uh, general entry requirements specifically for motorsport engineering, which my colleague maybe can give you more details and also the university website. You can get more details if you refer on that, but just I brief uh, Lee, uh, gather them here for the undergraduate. This is the minimum requirements for the Indian students here. Uh, also for the English language, you need to have the uh, IELTS academic for the score of the six and not less than a 5.5 5 .5 in each uh, sub skills here. And also about the scholarships and discounts. These are the list of the scholarships which University of Derby uh, gives you, which, which my colleague can give you more information, but, but just I have listed them here. We have the, especially for the Indian and Pakistani and especially Indian South uh, Asian students, the University of Derby offers these kind of a scholarship, international merit scholarship, which is about 1,500 pounds, international excellent student scholarships, 
vice chancellor scholarships, and we have the uh, great scholarships, which is the combination between the, between, with the partnership of the British Council and the Great uh, Britain uh, campaign. You can get applies to, to one of those um, scholarships based on your circumstances. So these are just a brief introduction, but for more information, you can always refer to the University of Derby, international student, uh, especially for the Indian students, so you can get more information. Also, you can keep it, uh, keep it uh, you can keep in touch with the University of Derby, which is a university uh, website, and also in Twitter or Facebook, or do you have the, uh, you can refer to University of Derby in the YouTube channel to get more information. Yeah, that's it, and uh, thank you very much, and I'm uh, happy to if you have any question. Thank you, thank you, Shahid. That was really useful. Um, we do have quite a few questions if I may request everyone to just come on the screen. Um, and I'll just quickly take us through just some of the ones that are coming in more recently. Um, I know we're over time, but uh, we'll just take a few minutes to answer a few of these. Um, there is OK, there, there are some kind of generic questions around studying in the UK, which I think is really useful to ask over here. Uh, what is the difference typically between a taught masters and a research masters? Um, Richard, do you want to take that one? I think the taught masters would be uh, purely practical and, and lectures, whereas the research would involve. Oh, actually, no, the research, the research um, would have more of a, a research project element. So all of our students have to do a research project, but the, the masters in research would have a much greater uh, content of research. So a much larger, longer duration research project than a, than a taught masters. Thank you. Uh, Peter, can I come to you for the next one? Um, what can sort I just of add, add something further yes, to what Richard yes, was saying? Yeah, um, yes, I, I actually did my MSc by research and I teach on a research, on a taught master, so I'm coming from both sides. And the way it was explained to me was, which makes sense, um, if you think about a taught master as building a house, then a research master is first you have to build your bricks because you build a, you build a course, you build a project right. yourself. Uh, whereas taught masters, there's a sort of prescribed route through it. So that's Lovely. hopefully that's. I think that's too. perfectly clear now to everyone. Thank you so much. Um, this is something I just want to expand this question a bit. There are a lot of questions around, you know, I'm, I'm studying this, but I want to do that. So there's someone who's, I think, studying uh, MSc, but wants to go in, uh, sorry, is studying BSc, who wants to go into MTech. Simil, so there's a question here around support provided for career change, like from mechanical to computer science. Um, you know, if we, I mean, what are the kind of, what are the, how does it work really in engineering when it comes to the background that you come in with, kind of changing your career paths between the different strands of engineering? Uh, what is okay to do? What is not okay to do? Is there a kind of quick summary on that? Um, Shahid, can I? Can I ask you to expand on that and then request the others to join in? Yes, but as far as I know, for example, because I'm uh, I was international student, came to the UK for studying my PhD. Uh, for example, my uh, background was in material engineering, but I uh, continue my postgraduate here in the UK on the mechanical sector or mechanical engineering. So I think for example, if you are a civil engineer, you cannot go to electronic engineering. So there should be some link, for example, mechanical manufacturing or material that are very close to each other. So based on that, I think that would be even though if there is no restriction to you to go from the electronic to the civil, but based on your background, you will get a lot of problem because you don't know a lot of basic basic things and basic knowledge in that specific field. So I think there should be some close relation between yeah. your previous field and the new field you want to continue. Thank yeah. you. Peter. I could just build, Richard, yeah. yes, yes, please, Peter. Yeah, I think I would I would agree with what Shahid's just said. Um, if, you, if you're doing a, a BSc, obviously that's a three year program, it's 1095 days doing that, doing that particular subject. And to transition on to a, a new subject, which is one year long, there's not really that time to adjust at the speed you would need to because the, the programs finished after a year. Um, having said that, the, the, the our entry requirements do look at people from a general engineering background because yeah. we have to remember that entry requirements are just that. Um, they get 
they, they allow people to meet the conditions of entry. It's more important what students do once they've arrived. So right. you know, it's entry requirements yeah. are just that really. But yeah. we wouldn't want to let people come in with a qualification that was way out of um, scope with what they're going to study for their own benefit. Right. Brilliant. No, thank you. There's a question on theory and industry. I think we've answered that before. Um, Shail, I think this one's for you. Uh, how different is MSc Motorsport Engineering from MSc Automotive Engineering? Uh, it's basically what we have here in, in the University of Derby is a motor sport engineering. But the, as I said, we have 14 institutes or 14 universities which offers uh, this motor sport. But maybe there is some there is some difference in the in the uh, presenting of the field of the automotive or motor sport. Pretty similar in the uh, on the materials, but maybe. Uh, they have some more optional uh, courses or optional optional models to study, but both are pretty similar uh, based. But maybe the the, uh, the presentation name is a little bit different between the universities. But most of them, after the after the graduation, they can involve in the uh, motorsport or automobile sectors. Thank you, uh, Richard. Can I ask you this one? I and I expect this question to come in a bit uh, with Corona and with the pandemic. Uh, if a student, is it OK for students to kind of take a break between semesters in a master's? I know a master's is just one year, so it's obviously very short. Uh, but if somebody has to go back for an emergency or any problems, how is that looked upon in the UK? So we would typically have three or four weeks between semesters anyway as a break. So you have that that three or four week period. But obviously, uh, depending on the circumstances, we would try and be as flexible as possible and maybe talk about a leave of absence. So it very much depends on the individual circumstances. We would obviously speak to the individual concerned and, uh, and try and sort out the solution that's best for them. Thank you. I'm going to ask the last question. I, I can see that most of the questions have pretty much been answered. Some are repetitive, so I think we've hopefully catered to every question here and I'm conscious of time. Um, Peter, can you ask, uh, answer the last one, which is around, um, we know that in the UK you don't typically need an, in, in an entrance exam to go into a normal course unless it's like medicine or law. When it comes to engineering, are there any technical exams that students are expected to go through um, besides obviously the English exams, which is IELTS, TOEFL, etc.? No. <laughs> it's a simple, it's a simple it's a answer. answer. <laughs> uh, we use the, the entry requirements, uh, you know, define what we we want people to, to have when they come in. And I say as, as part of that, as mentioned earlier, it's what people do when they've arrived rather than what they've already yeah. done. And that's very similar to how you would start work. You know, people, there's been a few questions about finishing university and starting work. You wouldn't expect to go to a new company and know exactly how to do every system that they they will train you on those and they will improve you on those as you go. All they're looking for is that you've got the, the essential parts of the jigsaw to, to start and then you start to fill in from there. Brilliant, thank you. Yes, Prachi. Just would like to add, uh, if you talk about the English exam like IELTS or TOEFL, even those can be waived off, at least for Manchester Met, if I may say. If you have relevant scores in your class 12th board or the university you study from. For example, we waive IELTS for CBSC, ISC, that means central board, a few state boards and university graduates from Delhi, Mumbai or Calcutta universities. Thank you. Uh, I can see a question on engineering management. Prachi, thanks for answering it in the in the chat. Um, would uh, Darby or uh, Sheffield want to add anything to that? Do you do you do you offer that engineering management? Uh, I'm sure we offer something similar and uh, yeah, I'd agree with Prachi's comments. Um, yeah, I definitely relevant. To, yeah, to, interdisciplinary um, management and engineering is something that will be very useful. Absolutely. From Darby's point of view too um, and I would recommend uh, looking at the strategic engineering management degree if that's something of interest. Thank you. Uh, no exam like GRE? No there is no exam like GRE for the UK um, so no that's that's an easy one. Uh, okay uh, there was a somebody mentioned about chartered engineering in the presentation. Uh, 
Can anybody just uh, maybe elucidate on that a little bit? Uh, it, being chartered allows you to practice professionally. Um, it's okay. a recognized qualification that allows you to practice. Um, you can also become a chartered scientist. You can become a chartered environmentalist. Right. Uh, um, and uh, you know, it, it just shows that you have achieved a level of professionalism that allows you to practice within your discipline. In some disciplines, like civil engineering, for example, it's it's very very um, required to, to become a chartered engineer. But um, it will be good for your career in, in whatever engineering discipline you. Do. Brilliant. And this is obviously a relevant one. We'll definitely end with this one. Um, can you study engineering? at the master's level through distance learning? Is that something that's done, that is, uh, you know, even advised, even viable? Uh, would be nice to hear from all of you, actually. Richard, do you want to start us off? Uh, yes, we do offer certain masters of distance learning, and we're also implementing a hybrid approach for this first semester. So for students who aren't able to come to the UK before Christmas this year, yeah. We've given them the opportunity to study their, their masters online. So the answer is yes and and yes. Dabi? Um, yes, we have a, a large online department uh, at the University of Derby and the building information modelling and, um, and project management as well as the civil engineering degree masters are delivered online. So I will add a little link here. MMU, do you want to do you also have the same opportunity? There are a few courses that we offer on online basis, but the majority of our courses are on face to face only. So that means you will have to come yeah. to the campus. And uh, Peter, as the taught versus research master's expert, um, which is the best for job prospect? I mean, in terms of employability, is, is there a preference between the two? Um, I think um, it depends, but I, I tend on my research project was was around um, my background is I used to write video games, so mine was more around using sort of developing um, a digital resource to help help people learn. But that's very niche and yeah. not very attractive to an employer. Whereas if you study a number of units with different topics, that's more attractive to, um, in my opinion, to a potential employer rather than something that's been focused on one particular research subject, unless that's what they're interested in. I'm Excellent. I think that was, I, I mean, we can keep going with the question. So I'm, I am going to stop here because um, I think the panel's done a fantastic job of answering pretty much everything. So thank you, Prachi, Kritika, Michaela. You've been fantastic with your answering in the chat. And uh, thank you, Shahid, Richard, and Peter for being so forthcoming, so frank, and so, so helpful. Uh, with your answers. I think it's very obvious here that we're here to help you. We're here to help you understand how you can take forward your career and your ambitions of studying in the UK. Um, I hope this was useful. You will get an email soon on uh, with the recording as well as uh, with the details of all the panelists here so you can write to them and pick up the conversation where, where uh, we left it today. So I hope you'll be in touch with the universities. They are definitely very keen to hear from you. So do write to them and wait for our email to do so. On that note, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you for your time to the wonderful panel. Have a lovely weekend. Good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.